Hello, everyone. Welcome this evening to um, our discussion tonight, uh, our key discussion on CML tonight, which is hostly jo hosted jointly by the International CML Foundation and the Pakistani Society of Hematology. Um, my name Hello, is... Amanda. Hello, Marie. Hello. Nice to see you again. Thank you. Uh, yeah, here. thank you very much for accommodating us and having uh, this meeting, international meeting. Our expert, uh, Dr. Tariq Ghafoor, would be here and uh, we are presenting two cases. Thank you very much from Pakistan Society of Hematology and from the whole hematology, oncology and pediatrics community of Pakistan. Brilliant. And it's uh, great, great to have so many joining. And I, I know people are entering as uh, entering the room as we get started. For those of you who are unfamiliar with the, the ICMLF, um, I'll just give a, a quick introduction. Um, we're a physician and researcher based organization working towards improved outcomes for CML patients around the world. Uh, our work is to raise the bar of CML management through education, which includes meetings like this. And over the last 14 years, the foundation has been working uh, through preceptorships, meeting symposia and our online knowledge center to make sure that no matter where you are in the world, CML physicians and researchers have access to the best possible knowledge, opinions and experience. The other arm of the uh, ICMLF's work is in research and global research, principally working towards a cure for CML, but also along the way, trying to improve treatment pathways, patient outcomes as much as possible. Um, we do this through the Genomics Alliance. We have a TFR Alliance. There was a lot of work that happened during COVID around CML and um, various pieces of research in, uh, in process at the moment, including um, around pediatric treatment in low and middle income countries. Um, so that is the an, an introduction to um, ICMLF and, and I'll speak at the end about how you can stay in touch also. So moving on to our topic for discussion today, which is treatment of CML in children and young people. And I'm really delighted to introduce you to our panel for today. Um, and um, I will uh, do that first and then we'll come back to some of our logistics. So Professor Nabuko Hajia from the Columbia University Irving Medical Center, Professor Tariq Gafour, as mentioned um, previously by uh, Maureen from the Armed, Forces Bone Marrow Transplant Center in Rawalpindi, Pakistan, um, and his colleagues, Dr. Aisha Bibi and Dr. Hira Fareen. So um, just to say a little bit more about our speakers, um, Professor Nabuko Hajia is pediatric hematologist and oncologist at the Columbia University Irving Medical Center in New York, as I said before, and her research looks at pediatric treatment strategies for leukemias and lymphomas. She's passionate, about personalized and appropriate cancer care for children. And we are so very glad to have you join us here today for, for our discussion as our international expert. Thank you, Nabuko. And our regional expert presenting today um, is Professor Tarek Gafour, who is a pediatric oncologist and bone marrow transplant specialist um, at the AFBMTC. Um, Professor Gafour will be sharing a general introduction to pediatric CML care in Pakistan. And following his presentation, we then have two cases from uh, Dr. Aisha Bibi, who is consultant pediatric oncologist, and from Dr. Hira Fahim, pediatric hematologist and oncologist and pediatric BMT physician. So there is a lot to get through in an hour, um, but we do definitely want your contributions and your questions. Um, so please feel free to uh, come in at any any moment um, with, a, with a raised hand or question in the chat. Um, and so um, I will uh, stop sharing there and ask Tariq to um, bring us his first presentation. Thank you, Tariq. Okay, thank you very much, Amanda, for, um, for your opening remarks. So I will just go through this presentation. So CML is basically the myeloproliferative disorder characterized by the presence of the Philadelphia chromosome containing the BCR BL fusion gene. So the abnormal chromosome results from reciprocal translocation involving the long arms of chromosome 9 and 22. So about 6,000 patients are diagnosed each year in the United States. 
and it's quite rare in young children. Only two to three percent of leukemia and pediatric patients they are CML, and it's exceptionally rare in infancy. Only 0 0.7 per million in children between one and 14 years of age. So such a low number of cases results in very limited experience in pediatric hematologists about the management of CML. So it's the most common presentation uh, is non-specific symptoms such as fatigue, malaise, weight loss, and anemia. And in the chronic phase, patients present with marked hyperleukocytosis. Typically, they have blast less than 2% with basophilia and eosinophilia. Thrombocytopenia is uncommon. And bone marrow is hypercellular. There is significant granulocytic proliferation with various maturation stages as seen in blood. Blasts are typically less than 5%. And advanced stage should be considered if they are more than or equal to 10%. So in the accelerated phase, the WHO classification include uh, hematological, morphological, and cytogenetic parameters. In addition, they also incorporate additional parameters usually attributable to genetic evolution and shown by evidence of resistance to TKIs. These later response to TKI therapy criteria for, for AP are considered provisional until additional data support the findings. So one or more of the following hematological cytogenetic criteria are response to TKI at any time, including at diagnosis. So if you speak to the hematological criteria is persistent or increasing WBC count more than 10, and it is un unresponsive to therapy, then increasing splenomegaly unresponsive to therapy, persistent thrombocytosis more than 1,000 unresponsive to therapy, Persistent thrombocytopenia less than 100. 20% are more basophils in the blood, and 10 to 19% blast in the blood are bone marrow. And the cytogenetic criteria then include additional clonal chromosomal abnormalities as diet diagnosis that include major root abnormalities or new clonal abnormalities that occur during therapy. And then the provisional response to TKI criteria that include hematological resistance to first-line TKI, any hematological, cytogenetic, or molecular indication of resistance to two sequential TKIs, or occurrence of two or more mutations in BCR-ABL during TKI therapy. So blast phase, there should be at least 20% blast in the blood or marrow in the presence of extramedullary proliferation of blast. So if you come to the recommended test, they should be done at the at the diagnosis and follow up, such as the history and physical examination, documentation of the liver and spleen size below the cost respective cost margins, height and weight and BMI, tenor staging, and then CBC with the differential, baseline molecular genetics of uh, uh, PCR uh, or BCR ABL with transcript type and blood. Uh, uh, real-time PCR. So cytogenetics basically examine the bone marrow cells metaphase to count how many cells contain Philadelphia chromosome. And the phase techniques that detect the specific DNA sequences of cells in interphase or metaphases. And the real-time PCR test for the presence of BCR ABL at the molecular level. So other tests include the bone marrow aspiration and biopsy at the diagnosis, then every six months until the patient gets the cytogenetic response, then cardio evaluation with echo or ECG, coagulation profile, comprehensive chemi chemi chemistry panel, including the electrolytes and liver and kidney tests, and then lipid profile, thyroid function test. So initial selection of TKIs basically depend, there are only three TKI approved for children, such as uh, amatinib and then the second generation desatinib and nalotinib. So another second generation TKI, bosutinib and third generation protonib are currently being studied in pediatric trials. So any of the three approved drugs is appropriate as first line, but several factors they influence the which, uh, when you are choosing for the TKI, such as the drug availability is probably the most common factor, in especially in the low-income countries. Then ease of administration. Amatinib and acetinib are given once daily and can be given with food. 
Pernilatinib is given twice daily with food, should be avoided two hours before and one hour after the medicine. Financial issue, generic metinib is much less expensive than the branded products and second generation TKI is cost significantly more than metinib. And in the randomized studies in adults, second generation TKI such as desatinib and latinib induce a significant faster and deeper molecular mission. But no randomized trials are available in pediatric population. So dose uh, imatinib is they have different people have suggested different doses ranging from 260 milligram per meter square per dose to 340 milligram. We normally give about three, we usually give 340 milligram per meter square per dose. And then an alternative 230 milligram per meter square, it's given twice daily. And the certain may be 60 milligram once daily again. So they can have certain effects, but in the, in the cardiovascular, they, children can have hypertension, atrial fibrillation, reduced cardiac function, and sudden death. GIT, abdominal symptoms are probably the most common in the form of diarrhea, abdominal cramps, and sometimes we see hepatotoxicity as well. Thyroid dysfunction, hypogonadism, and growth disturbances. And the bone, it can cause decreased bone density. Growth and puberty delay can also occur. And TKIs are teratogenic, can, can cause fetal abnormalities or spontaneous abortion, particularly in the first trimester. And female, female should be consulted on safe sexual practice to avoid pregnancy while on TKI. And there are TKI is a preferred method for prolonged remission and cure in pediatric, but long-term knowledge about the side effect is, is limited in the children. So recommended tests during follow-up again include physical examination and history, then hepatosplenomegaly documentation below the respective costume margins, then tenor staging at every visit and uh, CBC and differential, and then monitoring with the P uh, PCR. So treatment response is measured with the, with the, in the in the terms of hematological response, where we measure the blood count and differential. And the complete hematological response means that WBC should be less than 10, and there should be no blast in the differential diagnosis. Platelet count should be less than 450, and the spleen should not be palpable. Cytogenic response is chromosomal bending and else is a bone marrow cells metaphases. Partial response means the one to 30% of the cells, they have Philadelphia metaphases and complete, there should be no uh, metaphase containing Philadelphia chromosome. And the molecular response is measurement of the pcr at transcript level relative to that of control genes. And major molecular response ratio of pcr expression to that of control should be less than 0.1% according to the international scale. So if you look at this, this uh, figure is just showing the way the hematological response, there is one large uh, reduction in the number of leukemic cells and the way the cytogenetic response, it is the uh, two logs and with the molecular, it is a three log reduction in the, and similarly with the major molecular response, deep molecular response, more than five log reduction in the blast cells, leukemic cells. So this is the European Leukemia Network uh, monitoring, you need to monitor on the three months, six months, 12 months, and after 12 months at any time. For the optimal response, the BCR ABL international scale should be less than 10%. And if it is more than 10%, it's a warning. And if there is no uh, complete hematological response, it means that it, it is labeled as failure of treatment. At six months, the international scale should be less than 1%. And if it is between 1 and 10% is warning, and more than or equal to 10% is a failure. So that you need to be documented almost on, on three monthly basis during the first year. And if we achieve optimal response, continue the same treatment. And if it is warning, then screen more frequently and then switch to the, to, to the treatment to the second line, depending upon the uh, response. So currently, no pediatric specific response criteria are available. The definition of multiple response is based on international scale and adopted from ELN guidelines. 
and the NCCN guidelines, and that can be used in the children as well. So patients who have suboptimal response, evaluate adherence to treatment, probably that can be the most common factor, especially if the children, they are having abdominal pains and symptoms, then sometimes they don't like to take the medicine, but probably most of the time they don't like. And then if compliance is confirmed, then other PCR PL kinase domain mutation. So for a metinov treatment failure in patient without identified specific mutation, switching to the second generation TKI is recommended. And for second generation TKI failure, patient can be treated with alternate TKI as a second line. Specific mutation need to be considered when selecting TKI also in this case. Um, Professor Gaffour, sorry to um, have to interrupt. I'm I'm mindful of the time and, and hoping that we'll be able to get to hear some of the, the case management as well. I wonder if you could um, uh, make a couple of comments about specifically the um, treatment of pediatric CML patients within within your context in Pakistan or low middle income countries um, specifically, oh. and, and we'll hear yes. from... Nuboku uh, on uh, her thoughts on that. So, uh, I mean, you just if you give me just one minute, it's, it, 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 in the case of advanced stage disease, you know, there is no specific data in the in the children, but there is only limited study. Thirty seven patient de novo CML, and they were a prognosis of the CML in blast uh, patient maybe better than reported in the adults, then the overall survival is only 30%. If you just ask me to the, um, sorry, you're going to the challenges in the low middle income countries, the basically the major problem is the shortage of medicine. Sometimes the medicines are not available and sometimes the medicine is available, but the parents, they can't afford the price of the medicines. And then the monitoring issue, sometimes we don't have the, availability of bcr ABR transcript levels and then again the cost of the test is sometimes patients they can't afford the med cost of the medicine and regular follow-up we still uh, sometimes we see the problem in the patient coming from the remote areas they can't they don't come on the regular basis for the follow-up mm. and then Challenge of the bone marrow transplant, limited facilities for bone marrow in Pakistan. Cost of the procedure is again, it's a huge cost about costing about 2 million or plus. And then the long term uh, effects of uh, bone marrow transplant on these young children. Thank you, Professor Gafour. I'd like to um, invite um, Professor Hajia to um, to comment. I'm very interested, um, Nabuko, on um, uh, what you see as being kind of most important to you in in treating children and young people with this disease, um, and um, and if you have any thoughts on um, on how that relates to some of these challenges that uh, Professor Gafour has. Uh, has um, spoken to? Uh, yeah, first of all, Professor Gafour, uh, it was a really nice review. Um, that's what, that was really good. Um, so in terms of the, uh, your question, Amanda, challenge in pediatrics, well, now, first of all, that's pretty rare, like Professor Gafour said. I mean, CML in children is pretty rare. So we have much less data than uh, the uh, uh, adult people have. So that's one of the challenges. Uh, in terms of the other treatment, because children may need the decades of TKI treatment, we don't know much about the long-term side effects. We have uh, had the uh, imatinib for a little over 20 years, but uh, if children need it, uh, like in their, uh, you know, in entire life, that would be like seven, seven, eight decades. That can be a problem. We don't know much about it. Um, and uh, also children have definitely different host factors. They are growing. And uh, like Professor Gafour said, uh, growth delay with TKI is a, a significant issue. But we don't really have much published data, but uh, from our experience, and I talked to my colleagues around 
they may have catch up growth when they start puberty. Um, and uh, some patients, some, some uh, uh, care providers observe, they may achieve the expected height from the uh, parents' mid-parental height. So again, those things, we still need to get there more data. And uh, thank you so much for summarizing the other challenges in your country and in other uh, low middle income countries. I totally um, acknowledge that. Um, so you did say there are three approved uh, TKIs. Well, in the US at least, we have four TKIs approved as frontline. So imatinib, dasatinib, nilotinib, and bosutinib was approved about a year ago. So now it's available. Is that a good drug as a first line? Uh, yes or no, that I don't know. But um, I think most clinicians in the US start with the imatinib or dasatinib. Uh, for the uh, first line treatment. Um, I think that's all I can say. I hope that Thank was you, okay. Nabuko, I don't know if sure. uh, Tarek, you have any comments in, in response to that. We do have one question in the chat as well I can go to, um, and uh, two in fact now. So um, we'll we'll cover, cover these uh, now and then, um, and then move on to uh, Hira's presentation. Um, no, sorry, we're going to go to Aisha first. Um, apologies. So um, the question is, the ELN response criteria is very strict, whereas NCCN response criteria is much less strict and allows BCR ABL of transcripts of 10% at six months to be acceptable. Do we practically follow a similar pattern in pediatrics? Um, any so, other? yeah. Um, the uh, NCCN is, um, um, you know, updated pretty often, at least a couple of times a year. And uh, I personally follow NCCN guidelines. Uh, I wish we had the pediatric specific guidelines, but as of now, I see no reason why we cannot follow the uh, NCCN guidelines. And uh, you are right, like in NCCN, it's not that they allow, but... Uh, uh, BCR able more than 10% at six months. It's kind of, I can't remember which color. Now they they color code the responses and yellow or light green, I cannot remember. But uh, I think that's appropriate to follow. And in terms of the other uh, follow-up, uh, Professor Gafour said we should confirm the uh, uh, complete cytogenetic response for that. Uh, we do need the uh, bone marrow. In reality, we actually stopped doing bone marrow. We followed the response by just PCR, PCR able. Um, if you know um, the test is available at the uh, centers in Pakistan, I think that's easier uh, to follow. That's just blood. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I don't think we. I mean, anyone around myself routinely do bone marrow anymore. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Professor Gafour, have you anything to say on that? Yeah, Professor? okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I agree that because this the sampling from blood is quite easier as compared to the bone marrow, but that was just a bookish thing. We practically do the um, PCR on, on the peripheral blood. That's right. good. Thank you. Um, a few other questions have, have come through, but I think we will come back to them all at the end and have a have a question session. I'm keen that we've got an opportunity to listen to the cases that are being presented. So um, I'm going to ask Dr. Aisha Bibi if she will present her slides. I think uh, you're able to do that yourself. Hello, everyone. I am Dr. Aisha. Um, I'm a consultant pediatric oncologist working in the Armed Force Institute of Bone Marrow Transplant, Travel Pindi, Pakistan. Today, I'm going to present a case of an eight-year-old male child. He is resident of Aftabad, Pakistan, and he is student by profession. He was presented to us in March 2019 with presenting complaint of, complaints of low-grade fever, generalized body weakness, and abdominal distension for the last 14 days. His past history was not significant. He was a developmentally normal child, and the family history was not significant. He was second in the sibling, and the parents were unrelated. 
on general physical examination he was obviously paler with no significant lymphadenopathy on abdominal examination uh, abdomen was soft non tender but with massive splenomegaly spleen was palpable 12 cm below the left costal margin and rest of the systemic examination was unremarkable on his baseline investigation his wbc count showed uh, wbc was 6 lakh and 14000 hp was 9.5 g per deciliter and the platelets were 1 lakh and 45000 peripheral smear showed myelocyte 35% metamyelocyte 6% and the vesofils 2%. Bone marrow examination was advised and his bone marrow showed blast 2% and the opinion of the chronic myeloid leukemia in chronic phase was made. So we advised PCR for BCR ABL which was positive 87%. On the basis of all these final diagnosis of the chronic myeloid leukemia in the chronic phase was made. and his treatment was started in the form of hydroxyurea and allopurinol and first line tk was started imatinib at the dose of 340 mg per meter square per dose once daily his response assessment was done first at the 3 months at the 3 months he achieved the complete hematological response his counts become normal and there was no uh, vitromegaly but his bcr abl was 14% as the patient was far away from the hospital we can't make his 6 months assessment but his 12 months assessment after starting the tk was uh, done and the his bcr abl at the 12 months was also positive it was 2.1% at one year so as patient didn't uh, achieve the molecular response with the imatinib so we switched the tk to the second generation tk nilotinib at a dose of 230 mg per meter square per dose twice daily and at this stage hla matching with his siblings was advised after starting the nilotinib his uh, response assessment at the 3 months bcr abl were again positive at the 6 months it was again positive and at the 12 months uh, he uh, he again didn't achieve the uh, molecular remission and on hla matching uh, there was no matched fully matched sibling was present this is a serial blood counts of the patient at the diagnosis uh, in the march 2019 he was having the high tlc count of uh, wbc 6 lakh and 14000 then it gradually decreases to 379 and his last uh, his last visit uh, in june 2024 uh, he showed the complete uh, hematological response is functioning very well there is no vitromegaly but he didn't uh, achieve the molecular remission with the second generation tki2 so we know if the patient have uh, no uh, response with the two tkis we go for the transplant but in this case we don't have any fully matched available so uh, i need the opinion for his further course of action in the treatment thank you aisha thank you. <laughs> great great case thank you for bringing that so i'm um, i'm interested to hear from from our experts uh, professor haji professor gafour any what are your responses to uh, aisha's case hello to my colleague um so first of all well thank you so much for the nice case presentation um i think dr i mean uh, professor gafour said that already the most important thing we need to check first is uh compliance i assume you check the patient's compliance is that right D dr bibi so assuming the i'm sorry go ahead hello yes yes we hear you ma'am are you asking something Yes, yeah, so uh, the yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Please. <laughs> um yes, Aisha, um Professor G was asking whether you had checked the patient's compliance. Yes, ma'am, we have checked the patient compliance. Patient is compliant to the TK to the first mm -hmm. generation 2 and then to the nilotinib to his compliant. Right. 
Yeah, thank you for confirming. Um, you know, it, to to this group, uh, the doctors, to the doctors in this group, that's an obvious thing probably, but uh, some doctors may not think about it. And you may be surprised on how many patients are so not compliant, non-compliant. So I wanted to be sure. And uh, also, uh, another thing we often forget is like interactions with the other medications. For instance, uh, like anti-acid, like H2 blockers that may affect the uh, the um, uh, bioavailability of the drug, uh, some TKIs. So you may want to check it. In the most recent version of the NCCN guidelines have a list of those medications. Well, in reality, in pediatrics, it's not like older adults you know, who are on hypertension medicines, hypercholesterolemia medicines. So that's a little bit unlikely, but you know, anti-acid medicine that's often used, uh, especially because some TKIs may cause uh, GI upset. So you may want to check that. And uh, the third thing would be, again, Professor Gafor said that already, we may need to check the uh, 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 BCR able and kinase domain mutations. I don't know if you have the other test available. And uh, if that showed specific mutations that uh, cause resistance to the other uh, particular TKIs, then that will uh, give you an um, uh, idea of the, uh, the right selection. Yes, ma'am, you are um, you are very right. But in our setup, we can't do the TKD mutations analysis mm -hmm. here. Okay, yeah, I know that's not an easy thing to do. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if, even if you have your test, um, you know, um, in some labs there is a uh, uh, like level of sensitivity. I mean that uh, if the level of PCR able one is like zero point one percent, they may not be able to do. But uh, yeah, that's a challenge. So the empirical switch from imatinib to nilotinib, I don't think that was a bad thing to do. And uh, in the current situation, um, looks like yeah, in your slide, the last PCR able one level was done a while ago. Is that the current level, like 0.7%? Yes, ma'am, 0.7%, the last one. That's the most recent one, the yes, current level. Okay, okay. okay, okay, maybe I misunderstood. So, yeah, 0.7% after one year with it, uh, with nilotinib. It is true. Well, the uh, NCCN guidelines really does not say the, uh, the response milestones uh, with the uh, second uh second line TKI, but I believe uh, ELN guidelines have that. And 0.7% uh, may not be ideal, but if this was my patient, I might continue nilotinib. Um, from my experience and uh, some uh, published data show that uh, like molecular response, like zero, uh, like major molecular response, like less than 0.1%, that can happen a little bit later. Of course, we do need to monitor the PCR very closely, but uh, I think he may still achieve MMR uh, in upcoming years. So, especially because he does not have a you know uh, appropriate donor, like you said, um, I would probably continue nilotinib as long as the uh, the uh, molecular level does not go up. Um, I think that's a reasonable thing to do, in my view. Okay. Can I have my comments? Hi, Marin. Yes, please. Please. Hi. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Hijia, for joining and Professor Tariq Afur. So this patient, um, we could not have the whole panel of TKD mutations, but three, uh, T315I was checked. So my question to Professor Hijia is, if uh, any child has T315I mutation, in adults we use ponatinib. So what would be your choice? Uh, this is the first question. Yeah. And secondly, as far as this patient is concerned, mm -hmm. so we didn't have any other choice, neither mm -hmm. desatinib nor bisotinib was available, nor we had any fully HLMH donor, 
nor he could, uh, could afford very frequent PCR testing. Mm -hmm. So uh, we de we decided the we discussed the case in a departmental meeting with Professor Tariq Afur as well, and we decided to continue with the nilotinib. That was the mm -hmm. best possible Good. option for yeah. us. So um, my second question is, do you have any experience or any comment upon haplotransplant for CML in pediatrics? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so the first question you asked me, uh, what do we do for children with the T315I mutation? So is ponatinib available in Pakistan for adults? Uh, yes, there are uh, a okay. few okay. programs good, ponatinib good. Yeah. available. If so, yes, there is some, of course, you know, ponatinib is still in uh, phase one study in pediatrics, but we do have some uh, experience uh, published in the literature. My group did present there like 20 some cases uh, of children uh, who received their uh, ponatinib and uh, it, is, it is safe. Of course, the dose is still undetermined because the phase one study is still ongoing, but uh, I think it's reasonable to use that. Uh, and in adult world, as you probably know, uh, they start with the 45 milligram once daily of ponatinib, and then when they go to molecular emission, they decrease the dose for the safety of, uh, in terms of the cardiovascular events. And uh, in children, we don't have that data again, but the base, I think we can determine the dose for children based on the, this 45 milligram once daily. Like let's say the patient is like 30 kilos. I think that's probably safe to give something like 15 milligrams. Yeah. Uh, so please look at the other uh, uh, published reports. One was from Frederick Mio. He presented the uh, cases from Europe and the other is from uh, Rossoff, R-O-S-S-O-F-F, -S 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 and my, I'm the, uh, the last author. So please look, the, the dose is various. And uh, the next question, I'm sorry, what was your question? Sorry. Oh, well, so the next identical. question was, I have to translate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. Well, honestly, I'm not a transplanter. I do not do transplant, but uh, we do have a separate bone marrow transplant team here. Our team really, loves haploidentical more than like uh, one antigen mismatched unrelated donor or two antigen mismatched they would choose haploidentical from a family member and uh, most recently i did have a young adult now 20 years old he was refractory to everything pretty much everything imatinib dasatinib nilotinib and i even treated him with a seminib uh, ponatinib we didn't try he didn't have a t315i mutation but finally we decided to take him to transplant and he got transplanted from his mother who's haploidentical and uh, there are some experiences out there so if your transplant team is comfortable with haplo you could consider but again in this particular case i would continue nilotinib uh like you said uh dr kang that's great thank, thank you, you very so much Thank you Thank for your you question much. as as well, um, Maureen, and um, and a, a great case. Um, thank you, Aisha. That's uh, provoked lots of useful um, discussion and insight. Um, we're going to hear from uh, Dr. Hira Fahim next, and I'm uh, I'm going to share her slides for her because we were having some challenges with that uh, earlier. So, um, uh, Hira, are you able to? Um, I'm sorry, they're the, you know, the different ones. <laughs> Are you able to make a start while I um, get your slides up? Uh, I am Dr. Hira Fahim, pediatric heme oncologist and pediatric BMT physician from Armed Force Bone Marrow Transplant, Raul Pindi. Today I discuss the case of a girl, kindly move on the slide. Uh, uh, currently she is 20 year old, uh, female, belongs from Raul Pindi, Pakistan. Next. She was first presented and kindly continue. She was first presented in September 2016, and when she was 12, 14 year old, and she was presented with a history of fever at the body ache for six months. On examination, she was paler and had an splenomegaly up to five centimeter. On investigation, her blood CBC showed the WBC count up to 1,66,000, 
hemoglobin 6.9 gram per deciliter and the platelets were 177,000. Due to the highly suspicions of chronic myeloid leukemia, her bone marrow examination was done that shows the chronic myeloid leukemia in chronic phase. Her B PCR for BCR ABL was also done at that time and that shows positive. This is qualitative PCR. As the patient was diagnosed as a chronic myeloid leukemia in chronic phase, so the tablet ametanib 300 mg daily was started in November 2016. During a response assessment after the six months of the TKI, that was in April 2017, her symptoms were improved. She had no any splenomegaly. She achieved a hematological remission. And her molecular response on the basis of the PCR were, was 0.21%, that is uh, optimal response. We again repeat the PCR after the nine month of the TKI in August 2017, and the molecular response was 0.095 international standard, that was again optimal response. Can you move? As our patient achieved uh, optimal response in molecular, but due to her younger age, and the availability of full atelier med sibling donor, that was her younger sister, she was planned for a bone marrow transplant. Her bone marrow transplant was done in 10th January 2018 with the conditioning trophy of busulfan 16, cyclophosphamide 120, and ATG 15. Uh, as her sister is a, a major ABO mismatch, so we gave a process, we gave process bone marrow with volume of 130 ml, uh, her total nucleated, nucleated cell is 3.79, CD34 is 17.29. During a uh, transplant period, her, there is a only mild complication. There was only a febrile neutropenia and mucositis that was managed conservative, conservatively. And when we say about the periodic chimerisms, uh, her day 28 chimerism uh, great, but greater than 95 percent. Her day 180 chimerism also greater than 95 percent, and her day 365 mean up from post transplant one year, you know, chimerism is greater than 95 percent. On follow up, as I already said, that day plus 180 chimerism that was in 20th July 2018, she had no any complaint. Her CBC is normal. PCR for BCR ABL uh, is 0.0058% and chimerism, I already said, greater than 95%. On uh, follow up more than a day plus T65, mean after one year post transplant follow up, she had uh, no any complaint, a CBC again normal. At that time, PCR was not done and the chimerism greater than 95%. The alarming situation happened after the 16 month of post transplant period day plus 477 uh, she had no any complaint cbc also normal but pcr for bcr abl from bone marrow is 0.011 percent that was positive so due to the positivity of the molecular response we started a tablet emetanet 300 milligram daily from may 2019 means we started the MHNF after 16 month post transplant period. Then now on response assessment, after three months of the TKIA, uh, the PCR for BCR ABL negative, that is 0.001%, kindly move on. After nine month of the TKIA, mean after two year of post transplant, post transplant period, PCR for BCR ABL again negative, then we repeat a PCR after 15 month of TKIA, then after 28 months of TKI and after three years of the TKI, means after four and a half year of post-transplant, all PCRs of BC are negative. After four years of TKI, means more than five and a half year of post-transplant period, PCR for BCR will again negative. And after five years, we uh, means more than six and a half year post-transplant period, PCR again negative. Mean we gave TKI for up to the five year from molecular relapse. As her up, up to the five year, her all responses uh, are negative for, for BCR, BB, PCR for BCR ABL. We follow the patient and then we decide to stop the MHNF from April 2024. 
now patient uh, taking no any medicine and her recent pcr for pcr abl is negative on 24th october 2024 and she had no any complaint she had no any symptoms and so we decide to follow the patient with six monthly pcr report can you move on the point of discussion in our presentation is is there is any role of the dli in case of the molecular relapse after transplant or second point is for how long tki should be continued in case of the molecular relapse once response achieved and is there is any options for the molecular relapse in case of the cml after transplant thank you Thank you, Hira. Great uh, presentation. Um, before I come to our uh, experts on the, the panel, um, just a couple of questions of clarification in, in, in the chat. Um, did, did the patient receive TKI post HSCT? Um, and uh, I think that was the, the same question repeated in the chat. Do you want to just come back on that detail? Post, uh, no, she received no any TKI after transplant. She okay. received when her molecular relapse mean after the 16 months of the post transplant period when she had a molecular response then we again start the TKI. Okay, great, thank you. Um, Professor Hajia, Professor Kapoor, yes. for responses to uh, Dr. Fahim's case and questions. Um, I had the same question and thank you for clarifying. Um, I don't think, you know, it's standard everywhere, but again, I'm not a transplant doctor, but uh, from my observation, more and more transplant doctors do give post-transplant uh, TKIs, looks like. Our transplant team would start it after like six months or so after the transplant, and they may continue. Well, again, there is no uh, strict uh, criteria for the duration, but uh, maybe at least a year or so, that could be longer. Uh, that's my observation. And uh, again, I do not have a, uh, you know, ex much experience with DLI uh, in this kind of situation, but looks like the patient is doing pretty well with the Matinep. So I would probably personally not, as a, a non-transplanter, I would continue Imatinep. And uh, my question to you is: oh, Have you checked? Have you been checking the uh, the chimerism recently? Uh, no, no, no. We certainly not checking any chimerism. Last chimerism was done after at the one year post transplant year. So you have not checked it for a no, while. No. But okay, yeah. No, I was wondering if the patient lost the graft or not <laughs> maybe you know yeah he's con uh, maintaining the uh, you know molecular emission you know from the uh, imatinib uh, but uh, again you know as long as he is in molecular emission he can maintain that i might continue imatinib indefinitely in this case having said that having said that uh, i'm sure you all know that Treatment-free remission, well, let's forget about transplant, but uh, in general, treatment-free remission TFR is a big topic. And uh, we are uh, really trying uh, to get more data in pediatrics. We recently completed the, uh, the study in children's oncology group in North America, but we don't have the result yet. And there are some results out there. But we do know what I wanted to say was when the, for those patients in deep and sustained molecular remission, we stop TKI, they stay in molecular remission, uh, you know, less than 0.1% without TKI, but there are still detectable uh, BCR able transcript. So I wonder, in, and, and we think that's because of the immune surveillance that we all have in the body. So in this case, again, I might recommending, I, I might recommend continuing a, uh, uh, imatinib indefinitely, but I wonder if there is this immune surveillance, which is controlling his level. So that's what I think. Thank you. Um... I um, I see we've got a hand raised and uh, there were a couple of questions to come back to in the chat. But um, just before we get to the questions, Professor Gaffour, um, would you like to uh, 
give any comment on the the case that uh, Hera brought, I guess, particularly as a transplant specialist? So I, I think because, you know, this child, uh, so she received a, a remission within three months after starting the TKI and she has been in remission for more than five years now. So because again, considering the cost of the medicines and other things, the decision was made to stop her TKI and we will keep her under surveillance. We also discussed the possibility of DLI in, in post-transplant. But probably that could lead to where because these children they are very prone to uh, GVHD, so just wanted to avoid the uh, chronic GVHD. So DLA was not given to this patient. So I think we will just wait and see and uh, and monitor her um, response to the with the PCR. Great. Makes sense. Thank you, uh, Raheel. Is it? Um, uh... I'm reading the name there. Please uh, introduce yourself and um, we'd love to have uh, your question. Thank you very much. I am Dr. Raheel. I am an adult uh, heme oncologist and transplant physician uh, from Rawalpindi, Pakistan. I have actually a comment uh, and a question that, uh, first of all, there was a, a question regarding use of TKIs post-transplant. So the adult recommendations are that if you are transplanting your patient in chronic phase, chronic myeloid leukemia, post-transplant TKIs are not recommended. And uh, they are recommended only if you are transplanting your patient in accelerated phase or blast crisis routinely. And my second uh, comment would be that as per NCCN definition, a molecule relapse is more than one log increase in BCR ABL transcript and loss of major molecule response. So in this case, if we see that although post-transplant BCR ABL was detectable, but it was still a deep molecule response for log reduction as it was 0.01%. And we know that molecular transcripts can fluctuate. So maybe I would not have started this patient on TKI at that time and would have monitored the patient for further responses. And if there was a rising transcript, only then a TKI uh, was to be introduced because if you see this patient pre-transplant achieved an early molecular response that was at three to six months the transcript was 0.21 percent so there was a high probability that this patient would have achieved a deep molecular response without transplant as well but after that we actually uh, did do a, did a transplant and then she received TKI for five years post-transplant as well. So I think at that time, I would have just monitored, monitored the patient more seriously with transcripts. And if the patient would have remained in DMR with a full chimerism, we might have observed her alone. Okay. Thank you, uh, Raheel. I'm interested in our panel's thoughts and also um, and particularly uh, Hera, if that's something that you had thought about and, and uh, want to come back to Raheel's question. Sir, you are very right. The patient also achieved a deep, the, her mo deep molecular response is also, she maintained her deep molecular response. So we can observe the patient uh, not to give in and we should not give in. TKI. It may be possible, but now we are saying in now our plan uh, as the patient is a very responsive to TKI, so it is better to go stop the TKI and see the response. Okay. Uh, Professor Hajia, Professor Gafour, any comment from either of you? Uh, no, thank you. Thank you so much for the, uh, the nice comments and uh, good to know what uh, you are doing on the adult side, right here. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Um, oh, May Mary. I have a comment, please? Yes, please do. So, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Hira, for, for a very nice case. Yes, it was a very early molecular response, and the patient was transplanted in a chronic phase. But uh, if the molecular uh, PCR, BCR, ABL was negative initially, initially, and it showed positivity despite being in deep molecular response, so if you detect it, it is very difficult for a transplanter 
to continue observing despite positive uh, PCR BCR label. So I think um, there is a difference uh, in the practice of uh, um, the transplanters. So it was not no harm in starting TKI uh, because uh, more DLI would cause uh, obviously more um, uh, GVHD. So um, if there is frank relapse or uh, major molecular response has been lost, so we would consider DLI. And if major molecular response is continued and we see the positivity um, more than the pre-transplant molecular level, so I don't think there's any harm, uh, harm of starting TKI and then observing. We could have probably uh, stopped it um, earlier than five years, uh, but... Uh, uh, in my humble opinion, I would uh, like to start. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Maureen. We are coming close to the end of our time, um, but I think before we we go, uh, there's there are a few questions, but I think I could loosely um, group them all as: Is it the same in children as in adults? Um, and so that that is my general question to 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 the panel to to finish on. You know, if there's there's one thing that particularly to be thinking about that's different in children than in adults, but there's a question about um, efficacy of desatinib versus Im Im imitinib um, in adults. Sorry, I stumbled over that one. Um, in second generation TKIs, um, uh, induces a significantly faster and deeper molecular remission than um, imatinib. Um, is that true for pediatric um, populations as well? Um, is it recommended to wait for six months before switching TKI rather than three months? Is that true in pediatric practice as well? Is it true in pediatric practice as well? I think is the general question. And if there is anything that is not, then please highlight it. Um, in the world, uh, in terms of the, uh, the level of molecular response, uh, among the uh, the TKIs, first generation, second generation, uh, there are no randomized studies in pediatrics, unlike in adults. But uh, the uh, the numbers seem to be pretty similar. And uh, in terms of what were the uh, the questions, like switching after three months versus six months, as I said, you know there may be some different. Uh, practices even among the uh, uh, medical oncologists, but uh, I have a tendency to wait a little bit longer. As long as the other level is decreasing, I would not switch the TKI after only three months, even if that's a little over 10%. Um, I, I must say, I did have a teenager who had their like 40% after six months, then I had no choice. I had to switch him. Actually, he's on Asiminib now. So um, I think there are a little bit different practices, but uh, that's what I do in general. And uh, what else? The, uh, the Oh, deep molecular response with the second generation. I think it is true in general, but uh, it does not translate to the uh, difference of the uh, survival outcome. Well, almost all patients with CML survive, so uh, it may not be a you know a big issue in terms of the uh, outcome uh, survival as the outcome. But uh, if you really want to do TFR treatment free remission, faster and deeper molecular response might be beneficial to get to the uh, criteria. That's great. Thank you very much, Professor Hajia. That is time for our session today. Thank you all so much for joining us. Thank you for your comments, your questions, your attention. Um, a big thank you to our panel, for uh, um, to Professor Hajia for joining us from uh, Columbia University and to our colleagues um, in, uh, in the um, AEB. I'm gonna get all those letters yeah. filled up. No, AFBMTC. Transplant mm -hmm. Center, um, uh, and for those lovely cases, uh, Professor Tarek Gafour, uh, Dr. Aisha Bibi, and Dr. Hira Fahim. And thank you um, to our colleagues, um, the Pakistani Society of Hematology as well for being our co host here. Thank you, um, Maureen, for your guidance and all your, your comments. Um, I really hope that we will see you again next month um, for our next discussion. Mm -hmm. On the 11th of December, yeah. again at 7 p.m., um, which will be on managing CML 
post BMT relapse with uh, Professor Parvez Ahmad and um, uh, and um, our colleague from uh, Canada, Jeff, who will be our international expert there. Um, until next time, please do stay in touch with the foundation. You can do that through our online knowledge center. Um, and um, you, that's where you can also find news and case discussions and papers of the month and also follow us on social media. If you have any follow up questions, please feel free to get in touch with the team. Um, you'll have received joining instructions um, from from our colleagues there. And um, and I'm sure they would love to hear from you. Um, but until next time, a big thank you again once once again to our panel and um, and we will see you next month. Good evening. Thank, thank you very you. much, Amanda and International CML Foundation, especially from Pakistan Society of Hematology and all Pakistani pediatric oncology community. Thank you very much.